Megatron wants what's in my mind. I'm not gonna go without you. This week on At The Movies, Shia LaBeouf, Megan Fox, and Optimus Prime battle evil robots from space. Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen. Sooner or later, you gotta let go. Cameron Diaz, Alec Baldwin, and Abigail. Don't let me see you again. Never. Never. Plus, Michelle Pfeiffer educates a younger man in the ways of love oh in Sharif. Life is short. From executive producer Steven Spielberg and director Michael Bay comes the sequel to 2007 smash hit Transformers. I'm Ben Lyons from E! Entertainment. And I'm Ben Mankiewicz from Turner Classic Movies. Starting things off this week, Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen. Let me put it this way. Terminator Salvation now has some serious competition for loudest movie of the century. Shia LaBeouf is back as Sam, a bit more grown up and heading off to college. Also back to the certain delight of the 14-year-old boys who will make or break this film, Megan Fox, who's as striking on screen as she's been on the 164 magazines whose covers she's graced. Hey, beautiful. Made you a long-distance relationship, kid. I got your webcam so we can chat 24-7. Sounds cute. I can't wait. Also returning are the evil Decepticons with an evil plot to do something really evil. It's up to Optimus Prime to convince Sam his destiny is to save Earth. We've kept much from you, Sam. This isn't my war. I fear it soon will be. I realize this movie is called Transformers, but my goodness, there was a great deal of transforming going on. Michael Bay certainly delivers on the action, but he brings you considerably more than you order. Oh, no. What do we got? Thermal Ripple. What's good about this movie is it maintains a reasonable degree of fun throughout. Unlike Terminator, which collapsed under the weight of its own self-importance, Transformers has a few laughs. I might have elevated the movie to rented status if not for its totally unsustainable two and a half hour length. Skip it. Ben, I was a big fan of the first film, and I think part of the reason why it worked is there was so much anticipation to see these robots for the first time. And Michael Bay and the team at ILM, the graphic studio that does the special effects, really delivered in that first movie. Here it's excessive and overkill, and your eye and your brain becomes numb to it rather quickly. Particularly your brain. Oh my goodness, because it's endless, and it just sort of loses the, the, the mystique that the first one have of seeing yeah. these things for the first time. You become numb to it. And I found that the filmmakers were really irresponsible in ignoring the younger fan base of this franchise. You mentioned the 14-year-old boys love the action and Megan Fox, but the language and drug references, completely unnecessary. I didn't have a problem with that. In fact, that provided some of the limited humor that was there, in particular uh, Julie White, who played uh, Sam's uh, mother. I thought she was funny. Uh, but in large part, uh, I agree with what you're saying. The one explosion after another, it's endless, it's mindless. It's as if Michael Bay was saying, you think I've blown stuff up before. <laughs> Wait till you see this. It was mind-numbing. You want it to be action-packed. You want the robots to have more of a presence, I suppose, in this. But it doesn't work because Man. it completely abandons any believable story. It seems like it's making it up as it goes along. A movie like this really? shouldn't be yeah. difficult to follow the plot points. and it's just, It was confusing. It's confusing and excessive, and it just missed the mark completely. I know why Megan Fox is, uh, is in the film, no question. But at some point, as you're trying to save the world and you're in the Egyptian desert, Maybe jeans and a t-shirt. I mean, enough. I get it. She's literally just there to run in slow motion and be eye candy. Very disappointed by this. I'm not going to have to say skip Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. One of the most authentic and powerfully believable war movies in recent times hits theaters this weekend. It's from director Catherine Bigelow, The Hurt Locker, starring an impressive young cast playing soldiers specializing in defusing bombs during the Iraq war. The movie begins in the center of the combat, on the ground, with Guy Pierce attempting to dismantle the film's first bomb. Why is Eldridge running? Make Come on, guys, talk to me. Drop the phone! Hey, boy! I can't get a shot!
Each bomb defusing scene thereafter builds with great tension. The film takes its time to let the action breathe and for the characters to establish themselves on screen. Jeremy Renner is just terrific as a brave yet unpredictable staff sergeant here in a powerful scene with his colonel, played by David Morse. Uh, yes, He's a wild man. You know that? Uh, Why well, shake your hand? Thank you, sir. Yeah. How many bombs have you disarmed? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Sergeant. Yes. I asked your question. 873. 873. 873. Both Renner and Anthony Mackie, playing Sergeant Sanborn, garnered Independent Spirit Award nominations for their work here, and deservedly so. We're going on a mission, and my job is to keep you safe so we can keep going on missions. It's combat, buddy. The movie methodically depicts the mundane and routine aspects of war that, if taken for granted, even for a moment, can quickly become deadly. See it. Lot to like about uh, the Hurt Locker uh, band. Uh, Catherine Bigelow uses a real scarcity of music during these uh, scenes of, uh, uh, where they're trying to defuse the bombs. But when she decides to place it in there, it's effective. And it's very subtle, but she allows the tension to build with the tension that you imagine the soldiers feel. There's a terrifying silence going on in their heads as they're working oh, on God. these bombs, and she sort of allows that to play out. I thought it really added to the tension, and I think in particular, uh, outst outstanding performances across the board, but I thought Anthony Mackie in particular really, really nailed it. And she's really able to take what you would conventionally expect from a Hollywood war movie and really kind of turn it on its head and provide a different angle and a different aspect and perspective on war. And a lot of the big names who show up in the film are there to support and are there Fines, for reason Pierce, and for yeah. meaning and not so simply to have a, a big name in the film to try and sell the movie. It's not about that. It's about really kind of having characters who are there to further the story. This movie reminded me of those great anti-war war films from the 1960s, Kelly's Heroes, The Dirty Dozen, uh, Hell is for Heroes, that sort of celebrate the sort of individual soldier uh, in a world that demands strict discipline and listening to authority, these guys who go out uh, on their own. I, I thought the movie worked from from start to finish, and I'm going to say to see The Hurt Locker. Coming up next, from the Oscar-nominated director of The Queen, it's Cherie, starring Michelle Pfeiffer. And later, Abigail Breslin is forced to make a difficult, life-changing decision in My Sister's Keeper. You know how brave you are. You'll never make a boxer. I didn't take him on for his boxing skills, Patron. No, of course you didn't. All the other young men I've had to do with can't wait to tell you all their innermost secrets. He never says a word. Up next, from Oscar-nominated director Stephen Frears, is Michelle Pfeiffer's return to a leading role, Cherie, a period piece set in France in the early 1900s. Pfeiffer is Leah, and she is a courtesan, what some today would call a high-end escort. Nearly 50, Leah knows her time living off the wealth of princes, barons, and dukes is ending. But as a favor to her friend Charlotte, a retired courtesan played by Kathy Bates, Leah helps mold Charlotte's son, Cherie, leading him away from his frivolous party boy ways into becoming a legitimate man of means. You shouldn't drink gin or brandy. Well, it wouldn't be polite to let my mother drink alone now, would it? You don't look at all well. You're quite right, Leia. Here's a bag of bones. A bag of bones. I feel fine. You're a bad color, distinctly green about the gills. That's I Rupert like Friend as Cherie, young like and quick-witted, but a bit nasty. Yeah, and soon the relationship becomes much more than an affair. But of course, the relationship is doomed. She's 49, he's 19. And in between the rapid-fire, witty banter of the idle rich, Charlotte arranges for Cherie to marry a woman his own age. I've kept him away from opium and cocaine and the cheap sort of drink. I believe you'll find he's a credit to both of us. I'm sure. Doesn't mean that little girl's going to be able to handle him. Michelle Pfeiffer is quite good, I think, but the script leaves Kathy Bates, talented as she is, with a bit of a cartoonish performance. These are certainly talented people who have come together to make something that simply isn't their best work. Skip, Cherie. Mank, where's the passion? Yeah. Where's the heat? I never once saw why Michelle Pfeiffer would be enamored with Cherie, who's played rather vapidly by Rupert Friend. He doesn't have that charisma to sort of take over a room, and I, I don't really see the appeal of his character to her. She's this worldly uh, uh, older woman who has obviously experienced, and why she would sort of give so much of herself to him, I never really bought. I wrote down in my notebook a, a ton of times, 
why are they in love? Like you said about Kathy Bates, not a lot for her to do, and she becomes kind of a, a one-note character when we both know she's obviously such a, yeah. a well-rounded performer, usually. Yeah, and also there's Stephen Freer's uh, voiceover narration. He does that himself, and it's heavy in the beginning of the movie and then vanishes for the entire second act and into the third act. And then it shows up again at the end, and uh, I didn't think that worked either. Yeah, absolutely. The film's got a light, kind of soft quality to it, but never really comes together and gives you anything of substance. So I'm going to agree with you and skip Cherie. Coming up next, Cameron Diaz is at odds with Abigail Breslin and Alec Baldwin in My Sister's Keeper. You're good. And taking a look at next week's show, Johnny Depp stars as the infamous John Dillinger in Public Enemies. Plus, Ray Romano and Queen Latifah are back in Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. That is one angry fossil. I'm just not sure you're seeing the big picture. What big picture, Cal? Spit it out. I know it's important for you to feel like you never gave up. I mean, who are you if you're not this crazy mother fighting for a kid's life, right? But it, there's like a whole world out there. You don't see any of it, nothing. Adapted from the best-selling novel by Jody Picot comes a movie that brought me to tears, My Sister's Keeper, starring Cameron Diaz. She plays the mother of two girls. The older is Kate, played by Sofia Vasilieva, and she's stricken with a severe form of cancer, while her little sister, Anna, played by Abigail Breslin, was essentially conceived to be a potential donor for Kate. Over the years, Anna has undergone several painful procedures in order to help her sister live. When her mother wants her to donate a kidney, Anna finally decides to take control of her own body. She's been in renal failure for months now. Well, no one can force you to donate if you don't want to, can they? They think they can. I'm under 18. They're my legal guardian. They can't do that. Well, that's what I want you to tell them, because they've been doing it to me my whole life. Okay that's Alec Baldwin as a lawyer trying to help Anna emancipate herself so she can make her own decisions. A difficult premise, and the two girls are stellar, especially Vasilieva, who finds the humanity and dignity in her character's struggle to stay alive. She meets a young boy who's also diagnosed with cancer, played very well by Thomas Decker, and the relationship blossoms into the richest part of the film. So what do you do when you're not here at the hospital? Nothing. Well, then maybe we could hang together sometime. The film does stumble at times due to the unimpressive performance from Cameron Diaz, who's obviously much more comfortable in comedy than she is in this film. I was drawn to the family dynamic as a whole. The film grabs at your heart, even if it's obviously heavy-handed at times. And be sure to bring the tissues. You're going to need them by the caseload. I think you should see it. Obviously heavy-handed at times. When is there a moment in this movie where it's not heavy-handed? I mean, look, I cried too because it's a movie about young children with cancer. It's incredibly sad but manipulative from the get-go until we were finished. See, I think Sofia Vasilieva is able to really create a well-rounded character here who's not just on one note suffering and pulling at your heart that way, but she's trying her best to enjoy the little life that she has and find the beauty in life. Sofia Vasilieva, I will agree with you, is the only good thing in this movie. Thomas Decker is very good as her yeah, boyfriend, that scene, that which scene. adds a lot to the film. I didn't believe Cameron Diaz. I didn't believe Jason Patrick. I didn't believe Abigail Breslin. Really manipulative the music the songs are literally so literal they actually have lyrics like I'm 12 years old and I'm so sick uh, and when I'm gone you'll be very sad I, I mean come myself on. really connecting with this character and really pulling for her and rooting for her and and, and really just being deeply moved by her Look, and I know fans of the book are gonna have some problems with the new ending yeah. in this movie the director here taking a little bit of a creative license abandoning the source material putting the novel aside I found the movie to, to be really tough and challenging and enjoyable. You mentioned the director, Nick Cassavetes, who also directed The Notebook. The Notebook had a sort of credible humanity to it. That'll make you cry, but that was a good film. This, My Sister's Keeper, simply isn't. Oh, have Obviously, a heart, man. Oh, I have a heart. I just don't want schlock. Skip My Sister's Keeper. Next, we have Afghan Star, and if you think American Idol is a cultural phenomenon here, imagine its impact on a country devastated by 30 years of internal strife, religious intolerance, civil war, and foreign invasion. In Afghanistan, one-third of the country watched Afghan Star. That is the equivalent of 100 million Americans. The film follows four finalists from the third season of the show. They are from different parts of the country, different tribes, different ethnicities, many of whom have been enemies for centuries. Now, this sounds childishly simplistic, but the show attempts to bridge those gaps with music, and you know what? It works. <laughs> Mafkuri Ozo Dobalandoro. 
افغانستان تقریبا پیروزی شده به خاطر از هیچ ترس ندارم But there's a real threat of danger That was Satara, one of only three women out of 2,000 contestants She makes the mistake of actually dancing on stage without her headscarf after she's voted off The aftermath? Well, she's evicted from her Kabul apartment and returns to her family's home fearing for her life This documentary is less about the show than the complexities of a changing Afghan culture. No question about it, I think you should see Afghan Star. This documentary is so effective, Mank, because as you touched on in your review, it's so much more than just a documentary about people going through an audition process on a, essentially a karaoke show, like Idol. Right. This is about an, an Afghan culture that's at a real turning point. It's about deeply rooted beliefs and how to sort of upend those in, in exchange for freedom and freedom of speech and, and singing and, and how music can you night cultures and it's just eye-opening and shocking from start to finish. technology coming to a part of the world that uh, starting with the Taliban's rule beginning in 1996 the uh, television banned computers obviously banned dancing singing uh, banned but it's also a reminder that we have to remember to go slow I mean we thought we rid ourselves of the Taliban obviously we have not that much is clear but we expect these changes to come quickly and yes while it's it's wonderful to see them embrace singing to some extent still I was really struck by the male contestants that they were even stunned by Satara's oh, no, These beliefs Satara's are dancing. deeply rooted within yeah, the society. This takes generations, this is the, not years. This documentary really showcasing the, the beginnings of change and real significant cultural change, and I think you should see Afghan Star. Coming up next, an iconic director's We're breakthrough film has a big anniversary to celebrate in our DVD Out Now segment. Yo, move, what up? Just cooling. Always do the right thing. That's it? That's it. I got it. I'm gone. Time to take a look at DVDs out now. It's been 20 years since director Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing hit theaters. Now it's available in a special anniversary edition on both DVD and Blu-ray. Arguably the filmmaker's finest work, the movie was nominated for two Academy Awards, including Best Screenplay and Best Supporting Actor for Danny Aiello. People were free to do the hell whatever they wanted to do. What free? What the hell are you talking about free? Free? There's no free here. What Do the Right Thing truly captures the deep racial tension and clashing of cultures existing in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. It launched the career of Rosie Perez, and it's one of my all-time favorites. You know, uh, 20 years later, uh, that movie still has resonance because when you watch it now, it's still a worthy conversation. Did he do the right thing or did he do the wrong thing? Balances great moments of yeah. humor and, of course, intense drama and just one of my favorite films. After I saw The Hurt Locker, I was reminded of another strong Iraq story, but this one made 10 years ago about the first Gulf War, Three Kings with George Clooney. Just one of these stashes would be easy for us to take from his deserting army, and that would be enough to get us out of our day jobs. Like The Hurt Locker, this is an inventive and really creative war story. At the end of the war, Clooney, Mark Wahlberg, and Ice Cube concoct a plan to steal gold that Saddam stole from Kuwait. But in the process, they come upon Iraqi civilians who desperately need their help. David O. Russell's Three Kings forces the audience to examine the madness of war itself whether the cause is just or not. So, Three Kings is available now, and the 20th anniversary edition of Do the Right Thing will be in stores on Tuesday. Want to know what you can't miss this weekend? Stay tuned for my three to see. <laughs> Closed captioning for At the Movies is sponsored by... Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago, Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience, located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. All right, recapping the movies on this week's show. Mank and I were both underwhelmed by Transformers Revenge of the Fallen and overwhelmed by its length. We say you should skip it. We both say you should see The Hurt Locker, one of the best movies of the summer so far. We both say you should skip Cherie. I say see My Sister's Keeper. Ben cried like I did, but is still saying to skip it. And we both were really impressed by Afghan Star. My three to see this week starts with a rarity from Sam Mendes, a film about a couple whose love is not decaying. It's a way we go. John Krasinski and Maya Rudolph star in this tender, funny, grown-up romantic comedy. 
And number two, if it's available near you, go see Woody Allen's Whatever Works with Larry David and Evan Rachel Wood. Some might say this is a rehash of older Woody Allen films, and guess what? They're right, but they're also overthinking it. What was funny 30 years ago, still funny now. And in number one, it's conventional wisdom that audiences aren't interested in movies about the Iraq War. That is unfortunate, but no matter the subject matter, The Hurt Locker is a moving, dramatic, personal story of the emotional brutality of war. That's it for now. Remember, we're always online, and you can follow us on Twitter. Go to atthemoviestv.com to find out how. Join us next week when we'll review Johnny Depp and Christian Bale in Public Enemies, plus Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. And until then, as always, we'll be at the movies. The only way that you would leave a jail cell is when we take you out to execute you. Activon Ultra Strength for powerful pain relief. A convenient applicator means no messy creams. Activon, applied directly where it hurts for joint pain, muscle pain, arthritis, and backache. At Walmart, the prices are unbeatable. Over 300 prescriptions are just $4. And a 90-day supply is now only $10. Save money. Live better. Walmart. Millions of pet owners trust 1-800-PET-MEDS for fast service, free shipping, and big savings. Call now or order online from 1-800-PET-MEDS, America's largest pet pharmacy. Hold tight stretch bandages and nonstick pads. Kirad, we help heal.